few years ago, we moved to the country, as many are doing these days. At first, we worked hard at our gardening and yard duties, but we found time to make our place inviting to the birds. One bright summer visitor that appreciated our suet was the red-headed woodpecker. A particularly energetic blue jay almost emptied our bird bath with his vigorous bathing. And an oriole did the splits while feeding on our oranges. Not long after settling in our riverside home, we found that wood ducks were one of our choice wildlife neighbors. Occasionally, we were lucky enough to see the courting males displaying before their prospective mates. After the excitement of courtship, the mated pairs might be found resting and preening in the sun. But soon they would be off on the serious business of house hunting. This was a cooperative venture with these birds, although the female did practically all of the actual inspecting of possible nest sites. One spring, we were pleased to find a pair beginning to show an interest in the cavities in the trees along the riverbank, directly in front of our living room window. It may be a bit surprising to the uninitiated to find a duck considering nesting high up in a tree, but the wood duck does just that. This cautious female, eyeing a cavity in a nearby basswood tree, waits long and patiently to make sure that a raccoon or squirrel is not already in possession. She finally decides to investigate and alights at the edge of the hole, just like a woodpecker, propping herself with her tail as she cautiously peers in. There are many reports that these ducks will fly at full speed directly into the nest cavity, but in perhaps a hundred observations, I have never seen this happen. We found that wood ducks normally prefer natural tree cavities with surprisingly small entrances. Many of these were only three to three and a half inches across. This serves to keep out the duck's larger enemies intent on destroying the eggs. Some ducks nest in holes originally made by the big crow-sized pileated woodpecker. The ducks move in the next season after the woodpeckers have raised their young. Unfortunately, in many places, the cutting of old trees has eliminated such natural nesting places for both the woodpecker and the ducks, and then man-made houses are accepted as substitutes by the wood ducks. While checking our duck houses one spring, I was surprised to cautiously open the top and find a raccoon sleeping in one of the houses. I, of course, lost no time in routing him out. We have since found that raccoons are one of the wood duck's worst enemies. Squirrels also compete with the wood ducks over the use of man-made houses. <coughs> they will pack the houses with leafy twigs in making their nests. The next year, the ducks will not use these twig-packed houses. So it is highly important to clean out all squirrel nests in the early spring before the ducks arrive. We have found that it is best to place houses on separate poles located at sufficient distance from trees to prevent squirrels from jumping to the house. Metal bands, usually sheet aluminum, at least two feet wide, placed around the poles below the houses, prevent the raccoons from raiding the nests. I 
I paint these bands in camouflage patterns to make them less conspicuous. Most people find wooden houses easiest to make, but houses made of metal are recommended by several biologists with long experience with wood ducks. Ten gallon oil drums are used. A tall peaked roof held in place by metal screws eliminates footholds for raccoons, opossums, and squirrels. Recently, we have found that houses made of heavy plastic have been used by our wood ducks. The slick surfaces prevent squirrels from entering. Wood ducks carry no nesting material, so I put two or three inches of pulverized rotten wood into the nest boxes as natural nesting material. If this is not available, coarse sawdust is a good substitute for the rotten wood. Another essential detail in wood duck house construction is the ladder that must be provided inside the house leading from the nest up to the doorway. Here a strip of coarse screen gives the ducklings a foothold to climb out of the house. Formerly I placed my houses at least 50 to 60 feet apart, but one of my neighbors put up a three-story house as an experiment and was surprised and pleased to have them all occupied. Carrying the experiment still further, he put a fourth house on the other side of the tree trunk, and all four of these were occupied by wood ducks. So he seems to have proved that wood ducks are nearly as colonial in their social behavior as our purple martins. Houses placed in trees along small wooded streams are ideally situated for wood ducks, although houses in woods on higher ground at distances up to a quarter of a mile from water will occasionally attract the ducks. Limbs blocking access to the house are removed. Then a hole is drilled for the single large lag screw that goes through the back of the house directly opposite the doorway. It is really a two-man job to put up these large houses. An extension socket wrench makes it easy to set the screw which fastens the house securely in place. Natural wood duck nests have been found as high as 100 feet from the ground, but 12 to 20 feet is usually recommended for nest boxes. Good wood duck populations can be developed about marshes and shallow lakes where houses can be erected in late winter. Then house sites can be easily reached on the ice and the houses erected without the necessity of working from the unsteady support of a boat. The use of an iron pipe as a support discourages climbing mammals. The house is finally bolted securely to the support and the roof is hooked in place with ordinary screen door hooks and left for the coming of the spring thaw and the returning ducks. Wood ducks are traditionally wary but some friends with a wooded pond near their home noticed a pair of ducks feeding about on the edge of their lawn. They scattered some corn and actually had the good fortune to lure them up to feed with the red-winged blackbirds, grackles, and robins almost under their living room windows. After the eggs were laid in one of our houses and incubation was well underway, I climbed up to count the eggs and was surprised to find the female on the nest and showing no inclination to leave. So I got my camera to take advantage of the opportunity to photograph the incubating female.
the light-colored material surrounding her is down plucked from her own breast, which helps keep the eggs warm. The first eggs to be laid are usually buried in the nesting material. But as the egg laying continues, one egg being laid each day as a rule, the duck begins plucking down from her breast until when the egg, a clutch of eggs is complete and incubation started, there is enough down to cover the eggs completely when she leaves to feed. Wood duck eggs require about 30 days of incubation. During this month, starting with the leafless spring aspect, the season advanced rapidly with the unrolling of the fiddleheads of the ostrich fern. The forest floor, so recently white with snow, becomes again white with several of the spring flowers, the Dutchman's breeches, and the blood roots, and one that uh, some people call a dog-toothed violet, but trout lily is really a better name for this really miniature lily. The latter are often called adder's tongue. All these blooms open early and mature their seeds before coming dormant in the heavy shade from the trees above in summer. Within a stone's throw of the wood duck nest, a prothonotary or golden swamp warbler arrived and began nesting in a cavity originally made by a downy woodpecker. And while the wood duck patiently incubates her eggs, the chipmunk in the stone pile nearby has become very much alive again after his long winter sleep. Finally, the time comes for the downy wood ducklings to appear deep in their shadowy nest box. This little fellow shows us his bill tipped by the hard white egg tooth, the can opener which helped him break open the egg shell. Out in the sunlight on the left, we can see the egg tooth still in place, while the duckling on the right has lost his, since it has served its purpose. Of course, it's hard for the children to resist the temptation to play for a few minutes, with the downy ducklings before they replace them in the nest. Ducks do not carry food to their young like songbirds such as the cedar waxwing. So it behooves the wood ducklings to get out of their treetop nests within a day or two after hatching in order to get food for themselves. Perhaps you've heard the story that the female carries the youngsters down to the ground in her bill, or that they ride down on her back. We were anxious to see for ourselves how they got down, so we took turns watching the house. And after long waiting, finally, on the second morning after the wood ducks hatched, we found the female sitting in the doorway, inspecting the surroundings to make sure that no dogs, cats, or children were stirring. Finally assured that the coast was clear, she drew back into the house and appeared to warn the ducklings that it was time to leave home. Then dropping to the ground, she called to the young, and the first bold duckling appeared in the doorway and took a first long look at the outside world. In a moment, in response to the mother's reassuring call, it simply jumps the 20 feet down to the ground. Number two has trouble reaching the doorway, but finally succeeds in making a very unceremonious exit. Number one had already hit the ground and picked himself up. Notice carefully how number two bounces and rolls like a rubber ball. Ducklings three, four, and five and the rest of the family follow in quick succession hitting the ground to bounce and roll down the slope. Rarely, if ever, is one injured by falls of 60 feet or even more. Only one obser observation to the contrary would hardly disprove the story that the ducklings are carried to the ground. So we watched again the next year at another house 
and exactly the same thing happened, although earlier in the morning when the light was still rather poor. Two and even three at a time, scramble up the little ladder, anxious to make the big jump. Still not entirely satisfied, we spied on the deck in the basswood tree. She too chose an early hour just after sunrise to make her exit. And again, she took time to satisfy herself that no enemies were lurking near. She too drew back and seemed to warn the youngsters. Finally, dropped to the ground, began calling, and again, after only a moment's hesitation, the ducklings screw up their courage and begin pouring out. Twenty-four of them in all in this case. Undoubtedly, two ducks had laid their eggs in this nest, and the one female successfully incubated this whole set of 24 eggs. Notice the twin leap. The youngsters peep continuously during this process, which helps the female keep her family together as, the, as she leads them down to the river only a few yards distance. The first to arrive at the water are anxious to get going, but the mother calls them back and forms the brood into a compact raft before starting the precarious crossing of the river to the wooded island where she hopes to rear her family. Instinct tells the young to follow the mother. This family in midstream encounter some rocks and the female swims between two of them. The strong current threatens to wash the ducklings downstream, but these remarkably strong swimmers put on full steam and finally succeed in their little game of follow the leader. Now approaching the boulder beach of the island, they finally reach the far distant shore where over the white boulders, a little dotted line of ducklings disappears into the shore vegetation only five minutes after dropping from their treetop nest. While the female is busy caring for the young, the male usually leaves his mate and joins other males swimming about in the floodwaters of the river. In early summer, these brightly colored males shed their bright plumage and assume a female-like dress called an eclipse plumage. The white cheek marks still identify them as males. All the wing feathers are molded at one time, and for a short period they cannot fly as their new wing feathers are developing. Later on during the spring and summer, we only rarely caught glimpses of the growing family cruising along the river's edge or feeding and playing about under the watchful eye of the always alert female. This period of a few weeks of growing up is serious business for young ducklings, but occasionally they take time out for a bit of play. As the young grew older, they became more and more independent and would wander off in twos and threes, exploring about through the cattails or out on the muddy shore. They might even venture out along the edge of the woods to chase after a few insects or to pick at a few berries.
Returning to the river's edge, they play at bathing along the rocky shore. Later in fall, both sexes and all ages of wood ducks gather together in flocks before taking off on their southward migration. As fall passes into winter, we always hope that a few of each brood will survive the hunting season and the dangers of the migration so that each following spring we will have our wood ducks back by our wooded island ready to begin again their annual nesting cycle.